Ouye. Henry Hudson first came upon the Hudson River by accident in 1609. Hired by the Dutch East India Company to find a short passage to India, the Englishman sailed his ship, up, his ship named Half Moon 150 miles up the Hudson to Albany before realizing that it was not the route he was seeking. It's June of 2016. I am in my dorm room. I face west towards it. Uie. This colonial desire and quest for indigeneity is the quest for new religion, a new mythology, stories that are formed and reformed through traumatic apocalyptic events define human comprehension, the genocide of millions of humans and non-humans. The fear of the unknown grows closer and closer in America a fear which shapes, shifts, haunts, and terrorizes like a being in the dark or the savage on a darkly forested periphery. it calls. I hate coming to New York. I hate the whole state. I've tried my whole life to feel welcomed here, but something is wrong. It's nothing anyone can undo at this point. I could nearly ignore it at age 12. Because it's 2002 and I'm in a canoe on a lake not far from my dorm room. A middle-aged Jewish man rows us onto the center of the lake. He feels it is his duty. He's supposed to say something very important to me. Perhaps he's going to apologize for how our lives unfolded. Instead, he rows us into a thicket of reeds. He doesn't mean to. Thousands of mosquitoes drink blood from my 12-year-old legs, but none bite him. After this, I realize that my skin can scar. Washington Irving lies naked across a landscape painting. He's very sick. He's hemorrhaging blood and bile. He looks as if he slept for 1,000 years and his slimy, moist skin hovers at the point of rot and liquidates on an endless oil painting of the Hudson River. He attempts to lift his head, but it rolls off his body, off the painting, and into the river. My brother's name is Hudson. Haunting layers of New York State beckon souls and souls and souls. The history of American colonialism is deeply entwined with nuclear warfare. American fear changes faces, but humanity still fears the atomic bomb above most. And it's endlessly radiating materials which kill and kill and kill for millennia to come. It is the terror of grappling with the unknown which unites all of these conspiratorial trains of thought. Because I know that the unknown is sacred and when faced with the unknown, I have a toolkit. I have ceremonies and relations which prepare me to face death, sorrow, and confusion. However, to the non-indigenous, to the white settler, the tools are few and they do not reflect ancient relationships to land and stars in this place called America. Does the unknown need to be fictionalized and transformed into a caricature to be grappled with? In that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city, and the map of the entire empire, the entirety of a province. 
In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied, and the cartographer's guild struck a map of the empire, whose size was that of the empire, and which coincided point for point with it. The following generations, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that the vast map was useless and not without some pitilessness. They delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. In the deserts of the West still today, there are tattered ruins of that map, inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no relic of the disciplines of geography. In order to fulfill settler futurities, non-white claims to indigeneity must be continually destroyed or ignored. Quote, indigenous peoples must be erased, made into ghosts, end quote. Even through genocide, land theft, and removal, the need to fulfill settler futurity continues through science. Uwe. Uwe, come. But I am scared of spirits in the trees, spirits disturbed in ruins of Mayan ruins of ruins. Archaeologists and pseudoscience alike have long attempted to revise the length of time and origins of indigenous people on the North American continent. Perhaps they imagine if Indians arrived from Asia a certain number of years ago, it could justify genocide, that we would not be from here in the first place. Settler futurities require the search for proof of our lack of indigeneity, and it is provided by the sciences. The same science that measured indigenous skulls, dubbed indigenous adults childlike and unfit to self-govern, or spend self-made money or leave government-designed prison camps, in examining the geography of a haunted space, one can imagine the American map laid over the land itself, the new map that has been laid over the continent is haunted by the land just beneath the surface. This is because English has equated belief with truth. Belief is our attitude towards relationships between the map and the territory. Western belief generally implies some kind of correspondence between the map and the territory. The most extreme version of this is that we can have a completely clear and correct map, a one-to-one -one correspondence between the map and the territory, or to put it in the vernacular, we can have the truth. This was clearly the project of the Enlightenment. Even though modern thought has cast a doubt on this, the West still clings to it." End quote. An American mythological past is created through the blending of the paranormal with the landscape an attempt to embed a settler past to create a settler future. Revealing the bias of settler sciences requires examining settler desires and beliefs, which ultimately form new myths and new gods. It's July in 2016, and I miss my house. The idea of a haunting on Turtle Island or any location implies layers of beliefs, layers of the living and the dead cohabitating, Americans, Canadians, white settlers implanting their own ghosts, layering their own stories over the top of the map and attempt to retroactively own a location. Serving as a paranormal theme, the Indian graveyard surfaces often in the American media, from movies to video games to books. The desire to possess human remains by European and American institutions is evidenced by the vast holdings of indigenous human remains languishing in colonial museums. 
Weinbler Jr. suggests the fervor to hold our bones as an extension of the desire for our deaths to make room for their indigeneity. Quote, if the propensity of whites during the summer of 1971 to grasp some bit of authenticity by locating, excavating, and embracing Indian skeletal remains can be interpreted as an attempt to discard their own physical, cultural, and spiritual heritage, then the collective psyche of white America was indeed in deep trouble, end quote. Americans are possessed by the desire for a settler past and a claim to indigeneity beyond spiritualist seances or local legends, a supernatural connection to place. Even though settler ghosts now populate the American dimension of the land, the vast landscape Indian ghosts haunt occupies the terrified American unconscious. The fear of Indian hauntings through graveyards or burial mounds or otherwise is pervasive in American media, perhaps as a figment of the facts about the genocide that occurred and occurs on the outskirts of the American subconscious. Perhaps those facts begin to filter through deeply settled fears about the unknown. Karen Barad writes, the difficulty here is the mistaken assumption of a classical ontology based on the belief that individual determinately bounded and propertied objects are actors on the stage, and the stage itself is the givenness of a container called space and a linear sequence of moments called time. But the evidence indicates that the world does not operate according to any such classical ontology, an ontology exercised of ghosts. On the contrary, this is empirical evidence for a hauntology. Memory, the pattern of sedimented unfoldings of iterative interactivity is written on the fabric of the world. The world holds the memory of all traces, or rather the world is its memory. Here, the hauntological maps of America collide, for America is haunted by the unfolding relationships between atomic warfare and indigenous genocide. Barad, speaking of ontology, includes the expansive nature of location, where the area she refers to as Copenhagen is able to hold a locational relationality that emanates outwards through space and time, nuclear power affecting human and non-human. Time flows in two directions. It is relentless. I hear something. I hear something. Gurgling. I wake up and it's 2021. I'm in my cousin Corey's cabin in Kyle. His home smells like weed and incense and sage. It's quiet, we're exhausted from the funeral. We go back to sleep. I wake up, it's 2016. I'm in my dorm room. I am scattered so far. Oglala, I am so far from home. I'm so lonely, I go back to sleep. It whispers, Uwe, come. It's 2021, I'm on the shore of the river. I lean deeply over this massive driftwood. I am full of desire for the river. I want to know. 
water flows and flows and flows and flows, a rush that flows both ways. I've reached a shore in my mind. Uwei, but I can't, I'm, I'm far away. The waves lap at the shore. The waves lap at the shore, but my mind has left. Perhaps it is the American mythology of extraterrestrials that flows in two directions. There's the Oglala Lakota perspective of spirits born through a constellation of stars, an American perspective of extraterrestrials born out of settler futurities. Perhaps if we examine America from the hunting of animals to ghost hunting, American contemporary and founding mythologies are the constant calculated attempts for the settler to obtain American indigeneity, stemming from their fear of the unknown. The events such as Columbus arrival, the Boston Tea Party, to the fervor of aliens and UFOs, to paranormal experiences, to spiritualism, to New Age and American Wicca, to hunting and mounting dead animals' heads. American mythology recreates conspiracy theories endlessly to justify its insatiable desire for resource extraction. Manifest Destiny articulates taking ownership over time and reconfiguring it into a one-way linear street, progression towards apocalypse. For American Indians and other peoples targeted by the United States government, conspiracies prove true. Those targeted, native and otherwise, understand as the violence of American mythology pours across the continent, it was and is abduction and assimilation or death. How can indigenous non-human ontologies orient our ethics for the future? Understanding extraterrestrials as a product of American mythology requires seeing all these fears as part of the American unconsciousness, a hydra of conspiracy that shapes America as a nation. The intersections between extraterrestrials and American nation state fracture into even more intricate pieces of the unsolvable puzzle. Aliens, Illuminati, National Security Agency, surveillance, Kennedy assassination, hauntings, Pentagon Papers, 9-11 was an inside job, the virus is a hoax. Theories only remain theories for Americans as long as it takes to prove them. But for American Indians and other people targeted by the United States government, theories prove true. The FBI was embedded in the American Indian movement, just as the FBI targets black identity extremist groups, quote unquote. Manifest destiny is the term used to describe the continent-wide genocide by settlers and their continued legacy of colonialism. While it is often interpreted as symbolizing ownership of space, again, this is ownership over time. The soul of the settler can never fully rest or settle until it fully owns the land. The quest for indigeneity is the quest to create a new identity altogether. Who believes in Indians? Imagine conspiracies are used to continue to perpetuate white supremacist settler futures while real conspiracies continue constantly as a form of internal colonialism. Tuck and Yang write the internal colonialism involves the use of particularized modes of control, prisons, ghettos, minoritizing, schooling, policing, to ensure the ascendancy of a nation and its elite. American mythological past is created through the blending of the paranormal with the landscape, an attempt to embed 
revealing the bias of settler sciences is obvious through ideas of the phenomenon of tumbler witches, the post-1970 desire to invent American Indian ancestors, speaks to the desperation of the American to create their indigeneity. 37% of Americans believe in ghosts, if not other forms of paranormal events or experiences. In the 2001 Gallup Top Line report, quote, about three in four Americans profess at least one paranormal belief. The most popular is ESP, mentioned by 41%, followed by haunted houses, 37%. Upon examination of the full list, we find spiritual ideas around death, extraterrestrials, hauntings, all phenomena made popular by the spiritual movement, spiritualist movement of the late 1800s. Uh, in contemporary paranormal media, hauntings often start around that time, coinciding with that era. During the spiritualist movement in particular, those living on American land were holding seances while Indians living on Indian land were starving to death and being actively murdered. In the Euro-American context, ghosts are defined by both Christian teachings and spiritualist understandings. Even though, even thought of as possible results of time travelers, humanoids, and other theories. Much of the American paranormal landscape is borrowed from European conceptualizations of the afterlife. Borrowed mythologies laid over the top of the Americas, resulting in the pantheon of phenomena which persists today. In a recent conversation with artist Scott Benison Abandon, he spoke about the popularity of paranormal media. Most non-indigenous people, inter people's interactions with the mystery is that they want to provoke the mystery. This is like talking ghost stories around a campfire, right? They want proof or they want the thrill. They want to put their finger in the dark well of mystery, but they're not really wanting to be part of the whole lake of mystery. Ghost hunters, popular travel channel television show is where spirits are provoked to display agency. Now they employ body tracking technology in order to obtain quantifiable data of the unknown, specifically searching for anomalous body shapes. On Finding Bigfoot, the show does the same, searching for scientific data, proof of a paranormal, paranormal or cryptozoological being. However, they are often pointing their equipment straight into the darkness where it tracks dark shapes and error. What is a conspiracy to a country who hides a genocide? Caroline Woydite writes in her uh, really awesome essay, The Truth is on the Reservation, the accounts of the first encounters between European colonists and American Indians emphasize the need for constant vigilance. This narrative continues to retell itself centuries later. American Indians have been feared as conspirators, sulking enemies, threatening settlers, fierce challengers to Custer, militant activists at occupying Wounded Knee, unfair business competitors operating casinos and gas stations under different tax laws, aggressive plaintiffs in land claim cases threatening to rob white citizens of their property. At the same time, Native Americans are the ones subjected to con government conspiracies. My favorite Cold War phenomenon is Area 51, funded through black budgets. Uh, Annie Jacobson writes, uh, the spy plane programs were funded by the black budgets, meaning their existence was hidden from Congress and the public. The current requested black budget for, well, I don't know what it is now, but for 2020 was 62.8 billion uh, for the National Intelligence Program and 22.95 billion for the Military Intelligence Program. The entire 2020, uh, 2020 Bureau of Indian Affairs budget authority would uh, go down from 1.99 billion to 1 billion in comparison. So uh, act, actions like passing legislation to protect indigenous women and two-spirit queer people have been made nearly impossible by the government today. Mastery and force are the actions of enslavement. And Dylan Rainforth points out in his essay how Ab Aborigines invented the idea of object-oriented ontology. Quote, object mastery and territorial possession 
are demonstrably part and parcel of the processes of genocide. Land or location reduced to status of inanimate object incapable of intelligence or agency become resources to use and discard when the logic of mastery and possession is exploded over entire continents. Every entity is possessed along with it. A conspiracy of space is required to reshape the land itself into terra nullius, ready for taking by American settlers, or even reshape the land as having been possessed by Europeans through revisionist histories the entire time. Settler futurity relies on creating or recreating these mythological relationships with the land and the non-humans on it, often creating hierarchies of control over the non-humans therein. This desire to create indigeneity manifests in the practices of hunting. Hunting in America is a particularly charged version of your American necro-desire. The desire to preserve nature is the desire to control and own the natural world. In a particular Register article, a, uh, the title was Man Charged for Having Sex with Dead Deer, where a man in Bethel Park, Pennsylvania was arrested after he admitted to sexual relations with a dead deer. The police said they were called to a condo complex uh, because of a foul odor coming from his home. Upon entering the man's condo, police said officers found a headless female deer and they called in the state commission, game commission officials. Police said the man admitted to the game commission officials that he drank its blood. The man was charged with deviant behavior, said police, who asked he undergo psychiatric testing at the county behavior clinic. The deer had been killed with a crossbow. While this article qualifies the actions with the deer corpse as requiring psychiatric care, a quick internet search during uh, myself and my assistant's research for this project sadly and horrifically turned up hundreds of videos, animations, news articles, fictional stories, and uh, other media expressing male hunters' interest in sexual relationships with both living and dead deer. In a now deleted article, author Robert P. McDowell used quote unquote scientific studies from around the world to form his hypothesis. Quote, I will show below that the phenomenon known to hunters as buck fever is in effect a quote premature orgasm. This hypothesis finds that the hunting drive is not just a desire or want, but once initiated is an uncontrollable need a genetic neuropsychological activation of the brain forced on man by evolution slash God, just as is our sex drive. Mother Nature has rewarded man with a very pleasurable physical feeling second only to the intensity of the sex drive because he need, the need to eat and thrive is almost as important as her number one goal of reproduction." End quote. This scientific proof uh, shows not only the desire for sex and death, but the desire to make this association natural and embedded within the mechanics of the human male's connection to the earth. In the article, The Hunt as Love and Kill, Hunter-Prey Relationships in the Discourse of Contemporary Hunting Magazines, the authors Kelly and Rule write in their literature review of these magazines that, quote, hunting is a way for humans to recover two aspects lost through cultural conditioning, traditional ecological knowledge, and kinship with animals. Men are culturally conditioned to avoid compassion and sympathy towards animals. From Luke. Luke also articulates that, quote, love for animals is expressed as the, quote, desire to possess those creatures who interest or excite the hunter. Taking possession typically entails killing the animals, eating the flesh, and mounting the entire head or body. End quote. Uh, furthermore, uh, the research from Keel, 
uh, reveals that the notion of an ethical code of conduct exists as a mere facade through which hunters legitimize violence. British imperialists took wild animals from colonies for profit and to stage hunting exploits. Wanting to use animals themselves, imperialists restricted native people's use of them for food and, and cultural traditions. Big game hunting, quote, ritualized the display of white dominance. In a particularly favorite, favorite article um, of mine, uh, Brian Luke writes in Violent Love, Hunting, Heterosexuality, and the Erotics of Men's Predation about how contemporary hunting by the North American white men is structured and experienced as sexual activity. The erotic nature of hunting animals allows sport hunting to participate in a reciprocal communication with predatory heterosexuality. Quote, hunting includes killing, like sex includes orgasm. Killing is the orgasm of hunting, but like in making love, you know, looking in the eyes and just smelling, the long story is the real love making and orgasm, that the killing is the hunting, but only one part of it. End quote. North American uh, white men do not hunt out of necessity. They typically do not hunt to protect people or animals, nor to keep themselves or their families from going hungry. Rather, they pursue hunting as a sport. Ted Nugent, bow hunting fanatic, follows this pattern. He writes of anticipation, desire, pursuit, excitement, penetration, climax, satiation. His intimacy with the land is expressed by the need to control, rape, and kill the non-human beings in the ecosystem, a symptom of disconnection and deep illness of colonial domination. Philippa Descola uh, writes in the seminal animism text, Beyond Nature and Culture, quote, speaking of the Achuar people of the Amazon, it would be mistaken to regard the humanization of animals by indigenous peoples as mere intellectual playfulness or metaphorical language relevant only within the circumstances surrounding rites or myths. Even when speaking in altogether prosaic terms, tracking, killing, and eating game, the Indians un unambiguously convey the idea that hunting is a mode of social interaction with entities that are well aware of the conventions that regulate it. This is what are called covenants, and I've heard Vindaloria use that term. Descola continues here, as in most societies in which hunting plays an important part, it is by showing one's respect for the animals that one ensures their, uh, uh, their covenants. It is important to avoid waste, to kill cleanly and without causing undue suffering, to treat bones and remains with dignity. Among the Ojibwe of Ontario, the same principle appears to dictate the behavior of a novice hunter. Although he will eat his catch in the company of fellow hunters, he only does so in the course of a ceremonial meal that ends with a kind of funerary rite, a ritual that, dis that disposes of the animal's remains. In the story of the Lakota emerging from Makaonia, they are tricked by Iktomi and so helpless that we were pitied by the buffalo Oyate and the buffalo people stroke, uh, strike a covenant with us to feed and clothe our people in perpetuity, but we must hold up our reciprocal end of the bargain. Descola writes, quote, the animal is moved by compassion that he feels for the suffering of humans. Quote, the relations that Siberian peoples entertain with the animal world vary according to the partners. Hunting for wild reindeer or elk implies an alliance with the spirit of the forest, who is represented also as a provider of women. By copulating in his dreams with the spirit's daughter, the hunter consummates his alliance and wins the right to receive benefits from his father-in-law. Inuit hunting rights and birth rights indicate the souls and flesh, which are so rare and so precious circulate ceaselessly between different components of the biosphere, defined by their relative positions, not by an essence given for all eternity. As the shaman Ivalorajuk confided to Karl Rasmussen, quote, the greatest peril of life lies in the fact that human food consists entirely of souls, end quote. How can I take the life of another who is endowed with the same attributes as myself without compromising the links 
of the covenants that which I managed to establish with the community of that creature's fellows." End quote. Although the status of the Indian may fluctuate between human and non-human according to the goals of settler futurity, the status of nature of non-human kin that populate indigenous cosmology scapes and co-generate indigenous ethics remain other. It is through the status of the non-human and inanimate that a clear difference in how extraterrestrials emerge in Western ontologies versus indigenous ontologies. In the contemporary American alien cosmology, there is a pantheon of extraterrestrial beings, each with different origin stories and intentions for humanity. Some reflect author John Rader's proposed timeline as future white-skinned, blonde, blue-eyed beings, the product of progress and evolution, sometimes even superhuman, godlike, having implanted humans on Earth. The evil beings have far fewer human-like qualities, are short and strange skin, even reptilian, i.e. non-human. These mythological beings inhabit a settler futurity that remains fearful and suspicious of Terran nature and non-human beings. If mythologies and stories form the context from which ethics is generated from, American conspiracies and paranormal stories warn us about the price of nation building through genocide. In order to ground a description of a separate dimension on Turtle Island, Ethical relationships with non-humans, with deer, with bison, with stones, and with extraterrestrials are possible, but humanity would have to choose to understand non-humans through ontologies which lead to ethical relationships. Indigenous ontologies, mythologies, cosmologies already exist and already include non-human and extraterrestrial, but these are based on respect for the unknown. It is not possible to explain in the English language how intricately entwined the Lakota people are to the land, how non-metaphorical that relationship is, and how complex relationships, which include human and non-human entities, hunting rights, living rights, moving rights, inhabiting the sky and stars and earth. Drawing the ideas of indigenous normativity, Lakota cosmology also includes so many non-human entities that what is paranormal to the settler is normal to the Lakota. Ronald Goodman explains that the Lakota felt a vivid relationship between the macrocosm, the star world, and their microcosmic world on the plains, end quote. This relationship was understood in a metaphysical but deeply physical sense. There was a constant mirroring of what is above by what is below. Indeed, the very shape of the earth was perceived as resembling the constellations. For example, the Black Hills correlates directly with Lakota constellations of circles of stars. Examining the concept of the extraterrestrial from the Lakota perspective, it is key to remember that the Lakota extraterrestrials are those living in the spirit world, which is not Mars, but a place that is sacred. Goodman writes that the traditional Lakota believed that ceremonies done by them on Earth were also being performed simultaneously in the spirit world. What is happening here is happening there. This is described as the Kapemni, the twisting vortex. The Earth and stars reflect each other in Lakota astro astronomy, making clear the connections, the relationships, context, ethics, and spirits of stars and spirit world. Speaking about the hide maps, that show the earth and the stars. Quote, we were told by Mr. Stanley Looking Horse, father of the keeper of the original sacred pipe, that they are the same, these two maps, because what is on the earth is in the stars, and what is in the stars is on the earth. But on this physical plane in the settler dimension, the death of the Indian and the haunting replacement of the Indian with settler ghosts 
are the conspiratorial setups for a settler future of evolution towards extraterrestrial colonization of other planets. The ghost status of the Indian obfuscates the connections between disparate events and ideas, from the mining of uranium to the hunting of animals to the raising of teepees, but they are all connected because it is all indigenous land. Lakota beliefs passed from generation to generation give us the tools to process experiences of death, trauma, and genocide, and all that cannot be understood. In Indigenizing the Future, Daniel Wildcat writes, American Indian or indigenous traditions resist ideas of universal homogenous world history. There is no single road per se to human improvement. There are many paths, each situated in actual places, such as prairies, forests, deserts, and so forth. And environmental environments where our tribal societies and cultures emerge. The experiences of time and history are shaped by place. This is not a priori postmodernist or deep ecologist position. It is indigenous realist position. Lakota epistemologies enact the manipulation of time, space, and especially personhood into active cosmic vortexes beyond a settler map. The distinction between natural and supernatural, so basic in European thought, is meaningless in Lakota culture, writes David Posthumus. Humans are not superior in Lakota ontology. They are pitiful and helpless, younger siblings of the animal world. The Lakota sense of being and personhood is so immensely different from settler ontology that when combined with the Lakota ceremonial cosmology scape of tarot, astra, movement, and ceremony, we find the epistemological exit, a way to connect with the cosmos in a good way. Concepts of enfolding past and present, the knowledge of the complex spiritual personhood of other than humans, even aliens indigenous to other worlds, the connection to place inherent to Lakota understanding marks them apart from American mythologies, even as our dimensions and timelines collide. Online last week, I saw a question posed, what is ethical taxidermy? The answer lies in that Lakota knowledge is just the beginning of many dimensions of truths, responsible truths, which the diverse multitude of indigenous philosophies contain, though many may not believe the truth is already here. Here is the synopsis of a movie. Uh, a native art student at a private college in upstate New York experiences an outbreak of Lyme's disease, which is spreading rapidly, sickening her male classmates and sending women home. Soon she suspects uh, a group of men in her class are killing the women. The men's paintings and sculptures turn slowly into morbid and perverted representations of deer, leading the student to follow them into the forest when she makes a gruesome discovery and barely makes it out alive. A deeper haunting is occurring. It is a revenge of the forest, and only those who follow the protocols of the forest will survive. Thank you.